What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. He is Andrew Destin. I am Noah Hiles. As always, this show is brought to you by the North Shore Tavern. If you love baseball, you'll love the North Shore Tavern. The interior is wall to wall pirates, their appetizers, entrees, cocktails, and of course, steak and seafood on a sizzling lava stone. Open every day. The North Shore Tavern is right across from P- uh, PNC Park and is Pittsburgh's home for steak on the stone. Andrew, the Pirates are probably very excited to get back to PNC Park. We are recording this Wednesday evening. The Pirates just got swept by the New York Mets. Got a logo baseball with them right here. Um, and uh, drop five of seven games on this road trip. A lot to get into uh, before we get into our good, bad, and ugly. Just want to get your original takeaway or initial takeaway, I should say, from this series. A lot of places to go. Um, I think I'll an addendum I'll have to uh, your comments about the Pirates when I get back to Pittsburgh. I think they probably would benefit from that day off that they're having on Thursday too. Um, just getting away from the game before 13 in a row, I believe, is the figure um, mm-hmm. that they play. Uh, team doesn't look good right now. The hitting is obviously something that we'll get into at large. Um, a lot of decisions that we can get into in question. My biggest takeaway is just that this can't happen against the Mets. Um no disservice to the Mets. Obviously, they still have some talented players like Pete Alonso, like Lindor. Like obviously, this lineup still has dudes. Um, but that being said, um, we saw how the Mets started the season. We saw how the Pirates did. When you're going on the road, it's understandable that you can drop one. Um, it's understandable that maybe you lose a series. Um, but they did a good enough job of splitting against Philadelphia. Just given that that's a better than their record shows Phillies team needed to at least get one. And given the way that they played and got pitching. They probably could have won at least two of these. What do you think? Yeah, I tweeted the stat. Uh, They've now had 13 straight games where the starting pitcher has gone at least five innings and allowed three or less runs. And in those 13 games, they're six and seven. That can't happen when you're the Pittsburgh Pirates. It can't happen when you're anyone. But when you consider who these games are against, sure, some of them were against good teams like the Phillies, the Orioles. Those were the teams the Pirates beat. Like four of those six wins came against those teams. So I just, I, it's, it's, they're wasting some really good starting pitching right now, which is going to be, I'll spoil it. It's going to be your good and I'll let (laughs) you get into it. And this is a team that cannot afford to waste good starts because, you know, this isn't going to last forever, but Andrew, sorry for spoiling it. You're good at starting pitching. Talk to me more about it. No, you're good, man. I mean, that's – and honestly, I'll expand this discussion out to a larger point is what did we all say going into the season? What was going to be the biggest weakness or the biggest area of concern for the Pirates? It was going to be starting pitching. Um, it has been anything but that, and this series was further, you know, demonstrating of that. Um, Jared Jones, money through five innings, 59 pitches, was told he was going to go five innings, and that was the extent of it. We can discuss that more further but later, but Bailey Falter, another solid start from him. Not perfect. But good enough. I mean, you look at the way that they threw the ball this this series. It's like the bullpen didn't hold up its end of the bargain. But the good thing is that the starting pitching is holding its own. Um, I have questions about how sustainable that is in different uh, fashions. Um, we could get into individual stats about that. But, you know, Martin Perez's sinker is excellent so far. It's looked great so far. Um, has been one of the best sinkers in baseball, actually, depending on the analytics that you look into. So regardless, starting pitching has been really good. Um, that was no different in this series. It's just a matter of actually taking advantage of that in the Pirates' haven't. How about yourself? Um, my good is that this series is over. <laughs> uh, just because, I mean, the it felt like the longer this team stayed in Queens, the worse things are going to get. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like despite taking only two of four from Philly, there were a lot of positives that come out of that series. Uh, but you roll in here. Fresh off the Marco Gonzalez injury news. And, you know, you get three really good starts from your pitchers. You get nothing out of it. There was one extra base hit in three games. And it was Alika Williams who had the, the extra base hit. Um, there's been inj- weird injuries. I mean, Joey Bart, that 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 injury is like the most Pirates thing ever, isn't it? You know, I mean, the guy's catching a bullpen during batting practice and a home run ball flies over the fence and hits him in the head. How does that happen? You know, who, who, what other team does that happen to? It happens to this team, apparently. So, yeah, but I mean, 
it just felt like, the, yeah, the longer they were going to stay in this town, the worse things were going to get. Brian Hayes, um, just all of it, just all not great things, which we're going to get into in the further of the show now. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to keep it rolling. My bad, and again, there's a lot of bad to highlight. This team got swept, didn't score a lot of runs. Uh, my bad is the bullpen. Uh, the bullpen was supposed to be the strength of this pitching staff, and honestly, Andrew, it's been the worst part. Uh, you know, it had a really good first week of the season. It had a really good series against the Marlins, especially. Um, but you know, David Bednar got rocked again and you could say, Oh, whatever. It's a low leverage thing. It's hadn't pitched in a while, but eventually you're going to need to see this guy have two good and, or, you know, outings in a row. And we haven't seen that yet. Aronis Chapman did not have a good series. Did not have a good road trip in general. Um, I mean, Hunter Stratton came back down to earth a little bit. It just, you pick your guy, Luis Ortiz, Jose Hernandez. It's not good from the bullpen. The starting pitching was good enough to put this team in a spot to either win games or be in a place to potentially win a game. And the bullpen was handed the ball. And in all three games, it, it made it harder for the team to win. It's not the sole reason why the Pirates lost all three of these games in Queens, but it played a pretty significant factor. That's my bad. Andrew, what's yours? Um, my bad would be taking pitches. And I'm sure this will rile up a number of you as we get into hitting discussion, discourse about how the Pirates approach their ABs. Um, my way I'll look at it is this. It's you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Um, the first week in change, people were praising the Pirates about how many pitches they were seeing, how they were forcing starters out of games early. One series in particular that comes to mind is against the Nationals when you know, Mackenzie Gore, they made him throw a bunch of pitches in, uh, you know, high intensity, uh, you know, high stress innings. Um, but the problem is that, yes, the Pirates have the second most walks in baseball, but at some point you have to swing the bat. And that did not take place against the Mets. Um, and a figure that I'll bring up is that the Pirates have been aided by the league's fifth highest BABIP, you know, batting average on balls in play um, through this first, you know, whatever you want to call it, 10% of the season. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but at any rate, um, when they've put the ball in play, you know, they've been rewarded for it. The problem is if you're not swinging enough, um, eventually that figure, it's going to drop on you. Um, it's going to come back down to earth a little bit. They're about 20 percentage points up on last year's average. Eventually that's going to go back down. That's going to catch up with you. So at some point you have to question the hitting approach. You have to say, is there a happy medium? Because that really got exploited. And I think you can take that back to the Phillies series a little bit too. It was a little bit different, but certainly in this one of uh, going at a bunch of hitters who were, frankly, uh, afraid to take the bat off their shoulders. Yeah, uh, I think Shelton even expressed that. I mean, I don't think. I know he expressed that after the game. He said they need to be a little bit more aggressive at the plate. And it's kind of like, you know, the, I, I think you should leave me. It's like we're all trying to find the guy who did this. It's like we, we all know why this is the thing. This is this is the approach that's team-wide. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, a 5'10", 180-pound infielder or a six foot seven. 210 pound freak athlete shortstop. Everyone is kind of taught the same approach in this organization when they go up to hit. And, um, you know, you're going to have results where guys look, some guys look very comfortable with this approach and other guys don't. And it gets exposed sometimes. Um, my, my big thing on this too is, you know, Jared Jones talked about how leading into his start, he knew that the Mets were a team that was very patient at the plate. And he said, all right, if you're going to be patient, I'm going to attack the zone. I'm going to, I'm going to throw a lot of strikes. I'm going to go right after you and I'm going to get ahead in every count. And then you're going to have to be, you know, battling from behind. And isn't that ironic? Cause that's exactly what the Mets did to the pirates this series. Um, you know, you could talk about building pitch counts and everything. And sure. Like, yeah, they got the guy. I think every uh, starter for the Mets like reached like 95 pitches before the seventh, you know? So that's good, I guess. But it's like, all right, well, if they're throwing six innings and only allowing two runs, who cares what the pitch count is? They got through six. Yep. And when the Mets have a really good bullpen, which it's pitching really well right now, there's nothing more you can really do. So yeah, the approach, it has to, and again, I'm not, I'm not sitting here, you know, going up, up against Andy Haynes or whatever. I mean, he's a big league hitting coach guy. Was hired for a reason, but it's more just like yeah, like you said, Andrew. There needs to be a happy medium. I think there needs to be certain exceptions for certain people in the lineup where it's like, hey, you should be less, you know, lenient. You should be more aggressive than 
O'Neill Cruz should be more aggressive at the plate than Andrew McCutcheon. I think that that's fair. Like Andrew McCutcheon has been in the league for 15 years. He has an established eye. He knows the strike zone. He knows the umpire's strike zones probably way better than any scouting report or whatever can can give him. So he he probably understands this approach a little bit better than, you know, a guy in his early 20s who it's just kind of like, hey, see ball, hit ball. Go up there and do your thing. Um, so the ugly. There's two topics here. The big one. I almost say ugly was my Twitter mentions yesterday, but oh. honestly, but, but what that relates to is the Jared Jones discourse. Yeah. 59 pitches, 50 strikes. I don't know if I've ever seen that before in my life. Like in any level of baseball, like you could even think of like the most dominant little league pitcher, you know, <laughs> like kids throwing at least 10 balls in 59 pitches. Right. And yeah. that was, that was unbelievable what I watched. And I remember going to the media lounge, getting myself a nice little warm tea. Uh, and I come back out and as I'm walking to my seat, I hear now on the mound for the pirates, number 48, Luis Ortiz. And I was like, why? And boy, was there a lot of asking why and trying to explain why over the last 24 hours now. And um, I mean, the guy's on an innings limit. Uh, you look, he, he's thrown 122, I believe, in 2022. And he, think I threw, he threw around 126 last year. So if you go by that trajectory, typically, you know, they like to go up 20 to 30 innings a year as an early major league pitcher. So he's probably going to be at around 150. He's well on pace to shatter that right now. So you're going to have a couple of starts here and there where you're capped at five innings. That's just the way it works in today's baseball. Uh, a lot of baseball fans disagree with that strategy or maybe would like a little bit more of a human feel to it, saying, hey, guy only threw 59 pitches. Maybe we can get him a sixth. I don't know, Andrew. What says you? Um, the point that I'll bring up, which is, you know, this is more in just talking with different people in baseball circles. And it's a point that I want to bring up that I didn't see a lot of it on Twitter or people bring it up, but the up downs are an important component to this. Every time that you get up for an inning, when you're throwing your eight warm up pitches, that's part of the counter too. Now I get it. Some people may attack me and say, well, a warm up pitch is not the same as throwing in a game. Correct. It's not the same stress. But I bring that up to say that that's what's part of the equation here. And that's why in part, there's a hard cap on the five innings is that that's factored in. All of that's factored in. And I also think that you have to look out for Jared Jones's long-term health. Now I understand it's April. You want to win games. The Pirates first in the NL Central at that time. Um, you know, obviously now still doing well with the record. But Jared is 22. He is supposed to be part of this plan for the long time or the long term. So the way I perceive it is this is, yes, it is very confusing. 59 pitches, 50 strikes, five innings. I haven't seen that before uh, at any time. I understand it. I'm not condoning it, but I understand the rationale. And I think it's a deeper it, I think. The point that I'm trying to get at is there's a deeper discussion here than just the pitch count. I think that's something that you talk in baseball circles to people at the minor league level. It's important with the up-downs of getting guys through, okay, each time you go up for an inning. Like nobody on a rehab assignment, for instance, they never want to bring a guy in, you know, with an out already. You know, they want to have a guy have a fresh inning so that he can have an up-down so it can be clean, his normal routine. Like I think that kind of matters here for Jared too. Now – you guys are still allowed to not be happy about it because I think this is an important discussion really about just baseball and the trajectory of the sport. Yeah. I, and I also think Jason wrote this in his column. Uh, I think he ran this morning. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. yep. Where he said, what would pirate fans be able to stomach more? What happened with Jared Jones Tuesday night where he throws 59 pitches, he dominates a one hitter or if they let him stay in, and then after the game, Shelton says, listen, the plan was five innings for, for him today. Clearly, he was in the midst of something special. So we let him go another two, three. And because of that, he will not be making his next start. We will be doing a bullpen game because this guy's special. And when he's out there, we're going to let him compete. We're going to let him be Jared Jones. But we also need to think about him long term. It almost sounds like that's better, right? 
like I don't know. Maybe, maybe yeah. not. Like I like it's it, is it, exercise. I get it. Yeah. It's it's I think from a perspective of someone who just wants to watch entertaining baseball, I think it's better to like not have the carrot dangled in front of you. To just either be able to go all out and then have nothing the next time, then just have a little taste of it. Because who knows what would have happened if he stayed out there. That's like the most frustrating part about it is like, I mean, it's a one nothing game. And, you know, the margin of error is so thin. And this is a guy who has allowed, like the bulk of his runs he has allowed in the major leagues have come off of home runs, right? So, I mean, one swing in the bat and you just wasted however many more pitches that he did not need to throw. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, who's to say he couldn't throw a complete game in under 100 pitches? The guy from the Boston Red Sox just did it like, today. So, I mean, it looked like he was on pace to do a Maddox. So, well, no. Uh, who knows? Andrew, what's your final ugly before we wrap this up? What a lovely discussion we've had. I'll just, add, I'll just add that note. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I'm wrapping this up with another ugly, and that's Kibrian Hayes' back ailment. Um, we saw it the last two games wasn't in the lineup because the lower back issues were troubling him again. Um, I don't need to tell you all what he's been doing with the last couple of years. Obviously that kept him out of a chunk of games last year. He only played in 124 um, was certainly still very effective. Won that gold glove last year and healthy, but you never want to see this problem rear its ugly head, especially not in April and especially not for a guy who has documented chronic back problems um, this is not something that's going away. I'm not saying this all to all of you to say, hey, well, you know, red flags, season's over, nothing along those lines. The point I'm getting at is that for anybody who thought that Brian Hayes' back was good and he was going to play 162, think again, this is something that's going to be part of him. This is part of his baseball formula, however you want to write it up. Um, and it's happening again. And that's certainly something to monitor, just given how the Pirates are going to approach it moving forward. The good thing is they have a capable defender at third in Triolo, who's you know done a banner job at second. That helps. Um, but obviously, this is the reigning gold glove winner. Having him out of the lineup, both for his bat and for his glove, that's a problem. Yep. Completely agree. I mean, that's the first key piece to this whole thing that they extended, and they've yet to get 150 games out of him, right? Am I, am I wrong to say Maybe that? I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... I mean, that's tough. And that's not to say that it can't happen this year, but I mean, like the bat, it's not in his control. Like he doesn't, he, it's not like he doesn't want to be out there, but right. if he goes on the IL and I'm not saying he will or won't, uh, that'll be third, three straight years with a back injury on the IL. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Andrew, Red Sox coming to town this weekend. What's the one thing you're looking at uh, from the Red Sox? One key to that series get starting pitching out of the game um the red sox starting pitching is money uh, i believe as of us recording this podcast they lead the majors in team era for starting pitching uh it's a little bit over two um that's good um i say all that this is a good rotation that has exceeded expectations and frankly a red sox team that so far in general has exceeded expectations get to that rotation this is another opportunity to see is this legit does the bot does boston have some great arms or can the pirates get after it that's my big uh, big key to this series. Yeah, mine is, I, I think you saw me chuckle while you're uh, talking there. And the reason I chuckled, I look up Tyler O'Neill's numbers. This guy has a 238 OPS plus right now. Um, he is probably the most dangerous hitter in baseball. Uh, so f to up to this point in this season. I mean, they saw another one of them with Pete Alonzo, and I think they actually did a pretty good job in limiting him. But I mean, this guy is otherworldly right now. He's already, he's almost worth one war. And we've played, what, 20 games this season? Uh, he has 15 hits. Seven of them are home runs. Almost half of the base hits he has this season are home runs. He's hitting 313 with eight runs batted in, a stolen base. His OPS is 1290. And like I said, a 238 OPS plus for people who don't follow those advanced of metrics, a league average OPS plus is 100. So he is more than double better of the league average in OPS right now. So yeah, keeping an eye on this guy, that's something. And he's, he's familiar with this yeah. ballpark. He's, he's played a lot of games at PNC park. So Tyler O'Neill starting pitching should be a fun series. I don't know. There's, you look at it like on paper, this is something where it's like they they should continue to struggle. But like this is also one where it's like I wouldn't be shocked if they just won three. 
you know, yeah. because that's that's just kind of how it works with this team sometimes. Yeah, that's baseball. That's the Pirates. I don't know. They take two out of three. They get off the schneid and play a little bit better. How about that? Yeah, could be interesting. All right. Well, excited to see you, buddy. Haven't seen you in person for a while. Excited to get back home. Haven't been home in a while. I mean, my mailbox has got to be overflowing. I just found out my car is parked somewhere where it can't pee because they're putting a gas line on my street. Had to have my neighbor move it. It's chaos. I'm excited to get home to Pittsburgh. He's Andrew Destin. I'm Noah Hiles. Thanks for tuning in to Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. Check out all of our work at post-gazette.com, and we will see you again soon. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.